right, let's jump right in here. Proverbs 27. Look at verse number 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Now, of course, this verse is not talking about just planning for the future. It's, a, it's wise to make plans. It's wise to, to, to make you know, a plan for, for what you're going to do in the future and in the things that you're, you're, you're building towards and planning for. But what is the saying is to boast not thyself of tomorrow. What's boasting is bragging. Right? You don't want to brag about the things that you're planning on doing tomorrow. Right? You can't be bragging about things in the future, things that you haven't even done yet. The Bible is saying you don't know what a day may bring forth. There's uncertainty in the future. It's okay to make the plans. It's good to, to, to have goals and to set forward and, and to go towards a plan of action. But, I mean, the thing is with your goals, you need to be able to, to alter and change those when necessary because things come up in our life. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Now, turn if you would here. Keep your finger in Proverbs 27. Turn if you would to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 is, is basically teaches the same exact uh, proverb that we're, that we're learning here in verse number 1. We shouldn't be puffed up about the things, especially the things that we haven't done yet, the things that we're planning on doing tomorrow and just saying, oh, I'm going to do all this great work. I'm going to, I'm going to go do you know, whatever the case may be. Just, I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm going to do this next week. And you're bragging about it. Well, you better watch it because you, know, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Look at verse number 13 of James chapter 4. James 4 verse 13, the Bible reads, Go to now ye that say... Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Look at this next verse, verse 16. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You can rejoice in the things that you've done, but don't go rejoicing and, and bragging about the things you haven't done yet. He's saying, you know, the people who say, and it's not even necessarily something spiritual. He's saying, you know, today or tomorrow we're going to go into a city, we're going to go over here, we're going to, you know, continue there for a year, we're going to buy and sell, we're going to make a lot of profit, we're going to, you know, we're going to build this great business, and we're going to make all this money, we're going to go over here and do all this stuff, and you're kind of bragging about all the stuff that you're going to do that you haven't done yet. The Bible's saying, you know what, you don't even know what tomorrow's going to bring. Your life is like a vapor. You could be dead tomorrow. And all these great plans, all these things that you're, that you're bragging about now... To everybody else, to all your friends of saying saying how much money you're going to make or whatever the case may be. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be a worldly thing. It could be anything. You know, I'm not even going to boast myself of, of the, the soul winning that I'm going to do in, in a week from now or whatever. I'm not going to brag on, on the things that have not been done yet. They haven't been accomplished because you don't know what a day is going to bring. You don't know what tomorrow is going to be. And the Bible says that you rejoice in your boastings. You're basically feeling glad and, and, you're, and, you're, and, and you're bragging about the things you're going to do. And the Bible says that all such rejoicing is evil. So we need to keep ourselves in check and keep ourselves humble. That's why he says, you know, if the Lord will, if God wants it to happen, then we're going to go and we're going to do this or that. And having that, say, that right type of an attitude, have that right type of a mindset of, hey, this is what I'm planning to do it. And Lord willing, we're going to do this, right? If it's God's will, then we're going to do this. But I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. This is our plans. This is what we're working for. And that keeps you humble when you're saying, you know what, if, if, if it's in God's will for me to do this stuff, then we're going to do this. But if not, then I'm going to be doing something else. And that, that will help prevent you from bragging about the things you haven't even done yet, you haven't accomplished yet. We need to, to not get so... Um, you know, people have a tendency to get focused on these things that they haven't even done. Oh man, I'm going to do all this. Just wait. As soon as I get this out of the way, as soon as I get that out of the way, then I'm really going to live for God. Then I'm really going to you know, turn it on. I'm going to do all this great stuff. And oftentimes, more often than not, when people kind of talk like that, they get whatever done out of the way and then they're still not doing anything. They say, well, I just need to get this work done. I need to get that done. And then I'm, then I'm going to be, I'm going to have all this free time. I'm going to be going out soul winning every day, man. It's going to be great. And you boast about it. You're bragging about it. Telling everyone how awesome it's going to be. And then you don't go do it. 
And, and we need to, to make sure that we can keep ourselves in check and not, and not just start boasting about those things. Again, have a plan, but have this, the right attitude of, hey, if God, if Lord willing, this is what I'm going to be doing. This is what I'm planning on doing, and Lord willing, it'll happen. And what's interesting is that last verse there in James 4, verse 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And this is a sin that's not often talked about very often. Typically when we think about sins, we think about the things that we, that we do that we're not supposed to do. Right? I mean, the, the stealing, the lying, whatever, you know, all these various things that we're not supposed to do. Oh yeah, I commit a sin. The Bible's saying when you know it's right to do something, when you know you're supposed to be doing good, when you know you're supposed to be loving your neighbor's up, when you know you're supposed to be preaching the gospel, when you know you're supposed to be praying, when you know you're supposed to be reading your Bible, when you know you're supposed to be doing these things, whatever the case may be, and you don't do it, that's a sin. And like I mentioned, you know, oftentimes people will say, oh, I'm going to do this or that, that's really good, and they're kind of bragging about it before they ever even do it. He's saying you need to worry about what you're doing right now. You need to just make sure that the things you're supposed to be doing today, you're doing those today and not be so caught up in what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Let's serve God today and rejoice in the things that we've done. And continue to move forward. Let's strive to to, to increase. Let's strive to do more. We're not going to brag about it. We're just going to keep on doing what we're supposed to be doing today. And when we know we're supposed to do good and we don't do it, you know, that, that's a sin. Let's go back if we would, to Proverbs 27. We've got a lot more to cover here. I just wanted to point out because James 4 really goes a little bit more in depth on this concept of not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring and not to, not to boast ourselves of tomorrow. But let's go back to Proverbs 27, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. And I'm not going to go into detail very much. I brought this up last week. This this goes to, to point what I was made last week where Jesus talked about this. You know, it's, you, you receive praise from other people, not from yourself. You know, it, it, there's no honor in you telling everybody how great you are. There's no honor in that. I mean, no, you know, people are just going to think that you're conceited. People are just going to think that you're full of yourself when you just go around telling everyone how great you are. Just like all the presidential elections in my lifetime has ever been. You know, you got the candidate saying, vote for me. I'm so great. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm awesome. And I've done all this. And, you know, and just, just kind of boasting of themselves instead of, hey, let someone else praise you. Let someone else say, this person is great. This person does all this work. This person is someone that, that we should have as a leader. This is someone, you know, that's when you really get the honor. That's when you really get the respect. When you have other people saying, this is a good person. This is a good man. That's when you truly get the right praise. Uh, Jump down real quick to verse number 21. It kind of goes hand in hand with this. It says, As the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. You need to be tried before you can be found worthy of receiving praise. You know, no one's going to really know your character. No one's going to know your integrity. No one's going to know who you are and why you should be worthy of praise at all until you go through some of those more difficult times, until you're tested and you come through like the gold, like the silver. You go through the refinement and you come out strong, right? Uh, Job is a great example of this. He went through the trials. He went through losing everything and he remained faithful to the Lord. And, and when he was tried and tested and came through, then he was really worthy of praise. And I'm not saying he wasn't worthy of praise before. I'm sure he did a lot of great things. The Bible records he was you know, the greatest man upon the earth. But after being tried and tested through that, then everybody can attest, yes, this, you know, this person's worthy of our praise. They've been through a lot. They stuck with it. They have integrity. And that's when you receive that praise. And that's when you can expect to receive something like that. But it's not something that you bring upon yourself and tell everyone else how great you are. Let's keep going here. Verse number, I covered that subject in depth on Sunday and on Wednesday. Verse number 3. A stone is heavy and the sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? So we have a progression here. It's, it's likening, you know, a stone is real heavy, sand. You ever try to lift sandbags? Sand's real heavy. 
But a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. And then it goes from the, the wrath. It says wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. Obviously, you don't want to be on the end, the receiving end of somebody's wrath or somebody's anger. Right? It says, but then it goes beyond that. But who is able to stand before envy? Envy is a sin. Envy is something that, that is downplayed in our culture today, in our society. Envy, what is envy? It's when you want something that doesn't belong to you. When, you, when you're covetous. That's, that's another word for envy. Is when you really want something else. Something that belongs to someone else. You want it. The Bible says that's even worse than the wrath and the anger. Right? Most people would say, I don't want to be on the receiving end of wrath and anger. But you really don't want to be on the receiving end of someone's envy. When someone envies something that you have, because that goes, there's more motivation to do evil than even just someone being angry or wrathful in a moment. And uh, turn, if you would, real quick to Matthew 27. Keep your finger in Proverbs 27. Look at Matthew 27. Because this is exactly the position that Jesus found himself in. Jesus was on the receiving end of people who envied him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees of his time. When Jesus started preaching the truth, preaching the gospel, and he starts getting this following. He has these disciples, and it's just a small group. There's not much to be envious there. But when he starts going in and drawing these great crowds, and he's healing people, and all of a sudden there's flocks of people that was probably never set in foot in a synagogue before, that was never set in foot you know, with, for, to listen to the Pharisees teach. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus is just, I mean, he's got crowds of people. He feeds the 5,000. He feeds the 4,000. And there's, there's just so many people. Sometimes he has to not, he can't even be in the city. You know, he goes out onto the boat and he has to just push off in order to speak to everyone that's gathered together. And when the Pharisees and the Sadducees see that, they envied him. And they envied him so much, they put him to death. They killed him. And they would stop at nothing until they got it done. That's where their envy led to. In Matthew 27, look at verse 17. Uh, this is when Jesus was standing before Pilate. It says, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. He knew. He knew the reason why Jesus was He knew that Jesus didn't do anything wrong. And he kept on trying to get him off because he's saying, this guy, He's a just man. He didn't do anything. And he knew the real reason, regardless of whatever they're trying to accuse him of. He's like, I know it's for envy. So he's giving him another opportunity to free him. Now, of course, Pilate doesn't have integrity. He didn't do what's right. He listened to the masses. He listened to the mob when they said, crucify him, crucify him. Right? Let him blood be upon us and upon our children. Pilate did it. And he tried to wash his hands of the matter. Obviously, he's not guilt free at all in condemning Jesus Christ, but we see right here that he knew it was envy that that, the, that was the reason they delivered Jesus unto him. And envy is really powerful. And we need to make sure, especially in our own lives, that we don't become envious. Becoming envious is going to lead you into all kinds of sins. When you want things that you can't have, that you don't, you know, that you don't have, whether it be whether it be expensive things you just don't have the money for and you're coveting something that you, that you want in that aspect or whether it be people or, you know, like a, a, another, a different husband or a different wife or something, you know, someone else's spouse, whatever it is, whatever the reason is why you can't have something, watch out for the envy because it is dangerous. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The root. The love of money. What's the love of money? It's greediness. It's, it's desiring to just have more and more and more and just being envious of money. That is the root. According to the Bible, look, I believe the Bible is true 100%. That is the root of all evil. The source. The source of all evil. What's evil? When people are doing harm to somebody else. When you break it down and you go all the way back to the source, it boils down to envy, covetousness, greed. It's that love of money, the things that you don't want. That's what it boils down to. You say, I don't understand that. It doesn't make sense. When people have that in their heart, that love of money. It, well, look at, look at Proverbs uh, 27. Look at verse number 20. This, this will help explain that a little bit. Go back to Proverbs 27. Look at verse number 20. The Bible reads, Hell and destruction are never full. 
So the eyes of man are never satisfied. When people become envious and have that love of money in their heart, their eyes are never satisfied. They always want more. That that void is never going to be filled. They're going to be driven to do more and more and more. And they'll do whatever it takes to get it. It's like an addiction. It's like an addict that gets addicted to drugs that just all they could focus on is the drug. And whatever it takes to do, they're going to do it. They're going to rob. They're going to steal. They'll hurt other people to get what they want. It's a real similar, but the love of money and that envy does the same exact thing. People get, get wrapped up into that. I mean, the Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon, and mammon is money. For either you're going to love the one and hate the other, or you're going to despise the one and cleave to the other. You can't do both. We're not supposed to love money. Loving money is the, is the root of all evil, like I said. And that's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. You read that whole chapter... Watch out for the sin of envy. Uh, Let's keep reading. Let's go back up to verse number 5. We're going to see the importance of having good friends. We ought to be careful who our friends are and make sure we're choosing out right friends, godly friends, good friends to have around us. Look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Think about, it would be pretty nice if you found out that someone, someone in this church really cares about you. right? They love you, they care about you, but maybe you don't know it because they never say anything, they never really do anything. It's a secret love, right? They, but, but they just earnestly, they care about you. That would be nice. But you know what's even better than that, according to the Bible? Open rebuke. Open rebuke. Someone telling you that you're wrong. Just openly, just confronting you and saying, you know what, brother, you know what, sister? I, you, I think you're wrong in this area. I think you need, you know, you're, you're in sin. You know, whatever the reason is why there's a rebuke that has that become necessary to, to let that person know, that is way better than just someone who secretly cares for you. Because honestly, that, that open rebuke is really open love. And we need to understand that as such. We need to understand if someone is, 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 has gotten to the point to feel like you need a correction. It's tough to make that decision to decide that we're, I'm going to actually say something to this person. Because you know, you're already thinking, how are they going to respond? Is this going to damage our relationship? Is this going to damage our friendship? Well, what, what's going to be the outcome of this? Should I say anything at all? But when someone makes a decision to say, you know, this is important. I think they need to hear this rebuke. It's because they care about you. It's not because they hate you. I mean, 99 times out of 10, I don't know. I mean, you, there, you may have some jerk that's just full of themselves and think they just need to tell everybody why they're wrong. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about someone that cares about you enough to tell you, hey, you're, you're, having an, you're an error and, and, and you're wrong about this. And this is why. And that's why you approach people humbly and meekly. You know, you're not just trying to, to, to come at them as if like you know everything or whatever. But when you love someone and when someone loves you, they'll rebuke you. I mean, when, when needed, right? When there's, a, when there's a reason to have a rebuke. And we ought to appreciate that. If you have wisdom, you'll appreciate that. You'll be able to appreciate um, being able to hear those things. Uh, I'm not going to go into very much detail, but my wife experienced that. She had a friend that, that was, called her out on some things that, that they thought that she was an error of. And it stung and it hurt. But later, we could, you, she could look back on it and be appreciative that her friend was willing to... Potentially ruin their friendship because of this area where she felt she needed a rebuking. And um, reg- even regardless of if what she was doing was wrong and needed a rebuke, knowing the heart and knowing that, hey, this is someone who's, who's willing to, to lay it out there to help me, to, to, to help me correct my error. That's a big deal. And that is, that is uh, it's great to have friends like that. And if you have a friend like that, it's, you know, you may, your first instinct might be to get mad. And I understand that. Because no one wants to be told that they're wrong, but you ought to love that person. 
Because they, they honestly will care about you. Open rebuke is better than secret love. And that's why the Bible says in verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Being wounded, right? It hurts a little. It stings, man. No one wants to be told they're wrong. You get that rebuke. That's faithful. Your friend is being faithful and true to you, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, right? You can have people telling you all the nice things all day long. It doesn't mean that they care about you. It doesn't mean that you're a friend. It could just be putting on a front. You know, the enemy will do that. The enemy is going to make themselves look like they're just, they're your, they're your buddy and everything's nice and roses. That's why the, you know, the pastors that never preach on sin, that never point out iniquity, that never give rebukes, that never preach, thus saith the Lord, this is wrong, this is a sin, they don't really love their congregation. I don't believe that. They just want to make everybody feel good and feel comfortable. And when rebuke's necessary, look, it's way better to have open rebuke than secret love. And the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I'd be watching out and making sure that, that they're not my enemy, you know, that, that they're not an enemy for not, uh, not bringing up things that, that, I, that I would know I need to hear. But uh, let's keep going here. That's, that's, you know, that's one aspect of having a good friend, someone that's, that's willing to give you a rebuke when it's necessary. Verse number 9, jump down to verse number 9. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. A good friends can be able to give you good advice, good counsel that we ought to be able to take to heart. Verse number 10. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of, cala- of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. And, you know, our family, we ought to be close to our family. I believe we ought to be close to our, our physical brothers and sisters and, you know, our parents and stuff. But the Bible is teaching us here that you can have friends that are, you know, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And it's really good to have good friends. It's great to have people that you can rely on, that can edify you and you can edify them and build each other up. You see the great friendship of David and Jonathan in the Bible. It says that their souls were like knit together. They were, they were, they really cared about each other. You know, the Bible says that it's above the love of a woman that they had for each other. They were great friends, and 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 would do just about anything for each other. They cared about each other. They made oaths to each other, and that's a great friendship to have. Because then when one of them is getting in trouble, the other one's there to help them out. And we all need help from time to time. And the Bible is saying, don't forsake your friend. Don't just treat them like, like you're using them. Like, you know, they're there when you need them and just forsake them when you don't, when you don't need them. Because there is going to be a time, it says in your calamity, where it says, you know, don't go to your brother's house. who's going to be much further away. Maybe you got to travel a lot farther to get to your physical brother's house. When your neighbor's right there, your buddy's right there real close, you could just go and they'll help you out. Having a good friend is important. Now jump down to verse number 17. That words, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And, uh, you know, good friends will be edifying for you. Finding someone who's, who's, who's got that same, you know, you're both iron, you're both, you're, you're both uh, um, have this similar beliefs, or, you know, you're both Christian, for example. That would be a, a great example of having iron. You're both, you both love God, you want to serve Him, and that's how you're going to help each other to improve. You're going to uh, sharpen, but it says here, the sharpen the count the countenance, right? It's your countenance is your face. And and your friend's gonna help you, especially you know, in your times of trouble, your time of need, lift up your spirits and to lift you up and build you up with whatever help that you need. And that's what a good friend will do for you. So you wanna surround yourself with people, one, who love God, that that gain this wisdom from the Bible, who know what it's like to be a good friend. You wanna surround yourself by people who who have this understanding and will be a good friend to you, but you also want to make sure that you are that good friend to them. So whoever your friends are today, you want to make sure that, that you can be there for them and that you are willing to, to help them out and, and um, be able to lift them up and, and help them in their time of need. It's important to be a good friend, especially if you want to have good friends. And I think everyone should, should want to have good friends. So we need to just start off by, by doing that for others. And it's, it's interesting how it plays off of each other too. When you go above and beyond kind of out of your way to do things for friends it means a lot to them and oftentimes people when when you receive that love when you receive that that extra effort 
you almost feel like, wow, I haven't done anything for them in a while, and you kind of reciprocate back and forth, and it just helps to, to build your friendship overall. It's a good, it's a good, um, good, you know, good friends. I can't say enough about it. The Bible talks a lot about making sure you have good friends. Uh, let's keep going on here. Verse number 7. Let's go back up to verse number 7. <clears throat> the Bible says, The full soul loatheth in honeycomb. Loatheth means you hate it. The full soul loatheth in honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Now, I know I've been there before. We go out to eat. You go out to a nice restaurant, and you just, you just have all this, this huge meal. right? They serve you all this food. You get an appetizer. You got the main dish. And by the time you're done eating, you're like, oh, man, you're going to have to roll me out of here because I'm just, I'm just so sad. I'm full. I cannot fit another thing in me. And then they come and say, hey, would you like to have dessert? And you're like, no, I can't fit anything more in my body. And that's what it's like. You know, normally, if you, if you didn't just have that whole meal and someone offered you this nice, you know, sugary, chocolatey snack, oh, man, that looks great. Yeah, I'd love to have that. But when you're full, when you're just completely stuffed, you loathe it. You're like, I hate that. I don't want it. Get it away from me. Don't even put it in front of my face because I'm just way too full. This is what the Bible is describing here. But when you're hungry, and man, when you're hungry, you don't eat for a couple days or you don't eat for a day or whatever. You go a long time and your stomach's just, you know, growling and you, you, know, you want some food. You get a cracker, you get just a little bit of something, you're like, man, that, it, it just t- your, your, your taste buds have, have heightened, you know, your senses are just, you know, it's the best food that you ever have is when you're really, really, really hungry, and then you get something to satisfy the hunger, it tastes sweet, it tastes great, where normally you might not even like it that much, right, but you get that food when you're really hungry, and I think it's a very good thing to be hungry, I think it's good to keep ourselves hungry hungry. It's going to keep us humble. And I'm not just talking about physical food here. I'm talking about being hungry in many areas of our life. Not feeling where we've just we've stuffed ourselves. I've gotten to the point to where you know, I, 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 everything is going well for me. And I think it's important too, or I think it's better. I don't say important. I think it's better that, like, for example, in my family, that we don't have like just tons of money. We're not just completely financially set and just everything is going great for us. I think it's good to be a little bit hungry because I think it keeps us a little bit more appreciative of the things that we actually have. And I think that's another reason why it's important. You know, God says not to you know, seek after the riches of this world. Your Bible says, seek ye not um, the riches of this world. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We need to be focused on what's important. And if we struggle a little bit financially, that's fine because it's just going to make you appreciate all the blessings that God has given you in your life already. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. And we'll see a little bit more into this great truth of how blessed it truly is to be hungry. When you're blessed, every bitter thing is sweet. When you don't have much, you appreciate every little thing that comes your way. And I don't know about you, but I want to be appreciative. I want to thank God for all the good things that He's done in my life and not just say, who is the Lord? Not be so full of just of everything in life and say, well, God hasn't done anything for me. I did all this myself. And start having the bad attitude. And start thinking, I don't need anything. And start thinking, I don't need to rely on God. I don't need to have faith in God. I'm just going to, you know, I'm good. Because that's what happens to the full soul. You start hating even the the, the good blessings that come your way. Look at verse number 3, Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Many of these things that are mentioned here of being a blessing are very uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to be hungry 
It's uncomfortable when people are persecuting you and coming after you. It's uncomfortable to be poor. It's uncomfortable to mourn. These are not areas where you're feeling just like everything's going great, but God's saying, hey, you're blessed. This is actually a good position to be in because it's going to get better for you. You're going to receive. You're going to get, to, to get better and you're going to uh, acknowledge everything that's been done for you. We need to make sure we don't get so... Go back if you go to Proverbs chapter 27. We don't want to get too focused on the things of this world and our comforts here. Because once you... Even if you achieve that, you focus on that and you achieve that, you're not going to have a very good attitude because you're just going to loathe... You're going to loathe everything. I mean, who wants to hate everything? You know, who wants to hate the honeycomb? I think the honeycomb's great. I, I love eating honey. It's sweet. It's you know, but when you just have it every day and you just, it's always available to you, you don't appreciate it all, and you start hating things. And and honestly, a lot of people that that have a lot of money and just kind of have everything going for them end up being miserable people because they realize once you have everything, like it's all kind of it's all vanity, and it starts to come clear to you once you have everything that it's not all it's cracked up to be. Having all the riches and all the wealth and, and everything else, it's really not that fulfilling. And you start hating it all. It's better not to have stuff and enjoy the little things that you get. Enjoy that, that whatever it is that you, you work for and that little piece that you could have here that, uh, that's going to bring you a little, some happiness and not get wrapped up in, uh, in just everything that this world has offered. But let's go back to Proverbs 27 here. We've got a few more topics to cover. Verse number 8, as a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. Let's jump down to verse number 11. My son, be wise and make my heart glad, that I may answer him that reproacheth me. I probably should have made, you know, jumbled this in with, the, with the, the receiving praise. But the way that we raise our children should be able to speak about who we are. And we want to make sure we invest a lot of time in how we raise our children. And that we, we treat them because they're very, very important on, on, on how they're raised and should be a reflection of who we are. So when the Bible says, um, my son, be wise and make my heart glad, the parent always wants their children to be wise and to do what's right and, and to have this knowledge and to have this wisdom to make the right choices that you've done a good job of teaching and training them so that I can answer him that reproacheth me. So when someone wants to tell you why you're wrong for believing what you believe, you can point to your child and say, well, this is the fruit of that belief. This is what comes of, of believing this way or you know, thinking this way. Here's a living example. You know, Here's someone who, who does this. So uh, <laughs> a good example, I think, is when and I laugh because it's kind of funny now that my, my son is screaming back there. But he's one years old, okay? And they do that. But when you have people that want to criticize you and reproach you for, say, spanking your children, right? Giving them that discipline, giving them that type of a, of a correction. They say, I can't believe you do that. Well, when your child is, is being wise and well-behaved when you're out in public... You could point to them and say, see, I could answer them that reproach me with, well, look at how well behaved my children are. Look at what's going on. And I laugh as my, as my one-year-old screaming in church. <laughs> You're ruining my point, Jonathan. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, no, and that's, you know, it, it is important, though, to invest the time and, and to invest the, the teaching and the training in the truth. Because the truth is always, you know, God's word is not going to return void. And it will lead to the right decision making. When, when you're teaching and training and providing the truth, it's a lot less likely for the kids to make many of the mistakes that obviously the people that don't have the same knowledge will make. Because they'll understand the end of a matter. <clears throat> Uh, let's keep going here. Verse number 12. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. I already covered that about a week or two ago. Uh, verse number 13. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger, 
and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. And I covered this pretty early on in Proverbs about what, a sh- what surety is. And it's basically taking collateral when, when you give someone a loan, when someone needs something and you're receiving uh, something that, that's important to them. You know, right now, if you want, if you were to go and like test drive a car or something, you usually have to leave a credit card or driver's license or something to where you're not just going to take off with it. You're going to come back to get whatever it is that you left with them. Things like that. And that's, that's what be, taking a surety is. And what the Bible teaches here is that, you know, with the poor people, you know, you don't, oftentimes what they do is take a garment because clothes were really precious in those days. It's not like today where you just have racks and racks of clothes and everything's made in China and you got like, you know, clothing is super cheap. Clothing back then wasn't quite as cheap as hand stitched and there was a lot more work involved to it, so it was more valuable. And people didn't have all these, you know, tons of, of garments. Many people often only had one. So something that, that mattered a lot to them, if they needed something, if they needed to borrow something, need a loan, they would give them a garment and then come back for it. And the Bible teaches that, you know, with the poor, don't don't take their garment and keep it like overnight. You know, things that they really need when someone's poor, you give that to them. And there's a lot more leniency shown even just with your brother and stuff of not not even taking sureties necessarily. But it says here to take his garment that is surety for a stranger. So a foreigner, someone who's just, you know, basically what I was talking about, people who are not like, like saved, not children of God, these foreigners, these outsiders. You don't know what they're going to do. They're a lot more likely to be deceitful. So make sure that you take something as a pledge or as surety for them. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. He that blesseth his friend with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. You might be saying, Pastor Burson, what is what in the world is that talking about? Why would it be a curse to somebody to bless their friend or to bless their neighbor? Right? Well, it's not a curse to bless your friend, but it says, He that blesseth his friend with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. And what, what, I, what I believe this verse is talking about is, is, you know, the reason why you're even blessing with a loud voice in the first place is so that other people can hear you, right? When you bless someone, why does anyone else need to hear your blessing for that person? So what this is talking about is someone who is, wants to make it known, hey, everybody, I'm blessing this person so that they can think, wow, what a great person you are. What a great friend you are. Look at how great, look how nice he is. He's blessing his friend. The Bible is saying, you know, when you do that, that's going to be counted a curse to you. Because that's not the reason why you bless you. You don't, you don't do that so other people can hear how great you are. And that's what the Pharisees did. Again, you can read Matthew chapter 6. Jesus talks about them that, that love to wear the long garments. And they say the prayers and they love the praise of men. And it's that same type of Pharisaical attitude of someone who blesses his friend with a loud voice so to make sure everybody hears. Let's keep reading verse number 15. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whosoever hideth her, hideth the wind and the ointment of his right hand, which bereath itself. And I've covered this topic as well a few weeks ago about the, you know, the contentious woman. And a contentious woman is someone who likes to fight. Someone who who's wants to just argue with you. And I've, I've discussed this many times. I'll bring it up again. You know, the Bible teaches that the, the husband is the head of the household, that the husband is the one that has the authority over the household, and that he's the one that makes the decisions. And when a husband makes a decision for a wife to be contentious and just fight and argue over what the husband says is, is, is not right. It's unbiblical. It's wicked. It's not something that you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be humble and submissive unto your husband. And what it gets to here, the Bible says it's like a continual dropping in a very rainy day. And a continual dropping is not a good thing. I think in, in some places they use that for torture, where it's like strap you down and you just have like water just dripping on your head like over and over and over and over again. Now, it's kind of funny, you know, I, I, I'll give you that, but it's not. And, and we need to keep this in our hearts and remember that, ladies, I mean, look, if you love your husband and if you love your wife, you don't want them to leave you. You don't want to leave them. And, look, and, and if we're righteous, we're going to hold to our vows and say, 
I'm never going to leave or forsake my husband or forsake my wife. You know, I'm never, it's never going to happen. It's never an option because I made a vow and I, I made a vow to God. I made a vow to her. I love her. You know, I love him. I love her. I'm going to stay with them forever and I'm going to keep that end of the bargain. But people get divorced and things happen. And, and ladies, I would just say, you know, if you're contentious, remember, this is like a continual dropping. And I'm not saying it's right, but sometimes people end up leaving when they have a continual dropping day after day after day after day, it wears on people. And again, it, it, this is wisdom. Okay, we want to have wisdom. I'm not, I'm, it's no justification for anybody severing or divorcing their spouse. But this is reality. This is what happens. And we need to remember that you, you, know, you don't want to be that continual dropping. You don't want to just be contentious and fighting every step of the way. Let's keep going here. Verse number 18. Proverbs 27, 18. Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof, so he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. There is a blessing. There is, you will be recompensed for the work that you do. Keep your finger here, turn if you would, to Colossians chapter number 3. So it says here, if you keep the fig tree, you're, the, you're watering it, you're managing it, you're helping cultivate it, and you're getting it to grow, you're going to eat the fruit thereof. And you ought to. That's what, that's what you deserve. You're, you're doing all the work for it. You deserve at least to partake in the fruits of your labor. Just like the Bible says, you know, not to, to muzzle the ox that treaded the corn. Right? The ox is doing all this work and is treading out the corn. It ought to get a little bit of that corn. It ought to be able to, to partake in what it's actually doing and receive some of the benefit of the work that it's doing. And the Bible says, so he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. Waiteth meaning like, you know, like serving him. Right, you're, you're, you're like you're like a, a server waits tables at a restaurant. They're waiting on you. They're serving you. So when you wait on your master, your boss, you'll be honored. And if they don't honor you, if they don't recompense you, if they're a wicked master or a wicked boss, God will make sure it, it's that it's right. God will make sure that you get recompensed. Colossians 3, verse 22, the Bible reads, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. The way that we work for our boss, the way that we work for you know, our master, as the Bible uses the word master, it's our, our boss, you're a servant, you're an employee. We ought to work for them as if we're working for God. In our hearts, that's who we're really serving anyways. So the work that we do ought to be top-notch. It ought to be top quality, regardless of who the master is. And again, ladies, your husband is your boss at home. That's what the Bible says. You could go a little bit earlier in Colossians 3 or turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and you can read the same thing. The husband's the boss. And man, you got work, you got a boss at work. Hey, I don't care what they act like. I don't care how they treat you. The Bible tells you you ought to just serve in singleness of heart as if you're, you're, you're serving the Lord. That's the way that we ought to be. That's the testimony we ought to have. And, and you know, we're supposed to be humble and, and willing to, to take whatever comes our way because ultimately at the end of the day, God sees everything and you are being a very good example when you don't just make that person your enemy and try to right every wrong and then take matters in your own hands and say, well, I'm not going to work for them because they're not treating me right and they're only paying me this much and I'm worth this much. So I'm only going to give them this much of my time. I'm only going to give them this much of my work. That's wicked. That's a wicked heart. And that's a bad example. And that's a bad testimony that you're given. If you're going to be a Christian worker, if you're going to be known as a Christian worker, you ought to be working your tail off and doing what's right as if you're serving the Lord himself. And that's what the Bible teaches, that the way that we ought to be, that, we're, that we do it heartily with our heart as to the Lord and not unto men. And that's why it says in verse 24, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. God will make it right for you. And we have no doubt about that. Go back if you were to Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27, verse 19, as in water, 
face answer to face. It's talking about your reflection. When you look in the water, you see reflection in the water. So the heart of man to man, you are a reflection of what's in your heart. What, what, what you have inside of you comes out in, in your person and who you are. And um, again, this ties in perfectly with, with what we just went over. In, in serving the Lord with your heart will come through in your actions. Jump down to verse number 22. Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. And we covered a lot of ground about the fool uh, last week. But it's kind of interesting. It says, even if you bray a fool in mortar among we with a pestle, you just grind them, you know, and just really just lay into them. The Bible says, yet his foolishness won't depart from him. Fools very, and that's why, you know, there, there's not a right answer with dealing with a fool because they just are stubborn and stiff necked and won't have uh, anything to do with being corrected. Let's keep reading verse number 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. In order to sustain your wealth or whatever it is that you've accumulated in this life, you have to be diligent over your business. The things that you have, you ought to look well to. You you ought to take care of whatever it is that God bless you, whatever it is that you have. Now... It's not our, our primary focus and everything. You know, we're supposed to be serving the Lord first. But there, I mean, we do have to take care of ourselves. We do have to take care of our families. We do have a need to take care of certain things. And we ought to be diligent with what we do have and not just, just let everything go to ruins. Now, what I think is really interesting here is it says the crown does not automatically endure to every generation. And you see this as you read through the Bible also. And I think Rehoboam is a perfect example of this. Rehoboam had everything going for him. He had a great lineage. He had a great inheritance. He had, you know, David, his grandfather, the king, great man of God. Everybody loved King David. Everybody respected King David. You know, King David was loved by, by, by the whole nation. And then his son Solomon. And Solomon, again... Great prosperity in the years of Solomon. Great peace. No wars. Things were going, you know, the people loved Solomon also. But Solomon built these great works and the people kind of started to get a little weary of doing all this work that that Solomon was building this great empire and all these, these public works. So they go to Rehoboam and they're like, hey, you know, we've been working real hard under your father. Can you cut us a little slack? Can, can you give us a little break, right? Now, Rehoboam is someone, his whole life, he grew up with granddad David, dad Solomon. He's an heir, right? I mean, he's, he was the prince, now he's the king. And he, you know, he, he, he grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth, I believe. I, I think he grew up just having everything. I mean, Solomon had all these great riches. He had everything he could want. He didn't have a very good attitude. He didn't have humility. As Solomon, his father, as Solomon, his father had humility. When, when God asks him what he wanted, he, he entreats God. God, this is what I want. This is a great people. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to, how to lead such a great people that you've given to me, Lord. Please just give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. Help me to do the right job that you would have me to do, God. He was humble. He recognized he needed help. He needed to rely on the Lord for help. And God saw that and he loved that. And he says, you know what? I'm going to grant your request. I'm also going to give you the things you didn't ask for. Which was the, the financial wealth and the, and the life of his enemies. You know, in long life. He, he gave him these things because he had the right heart. He had the right attitude. And unfortunately for Rehoboam, he didn't even understand the Proverbs his own father wrote down. Riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. It's not just a given. You need to, to work at it. You need to, to do what's right in order to sustain what's going on. Turn if you would to 1 Kings chapter 12. We'll read this story real briefly. I know, um, hopefully everyone's familiar with it, but in case you're not, 1 Kings chapter 12. We're almost done. Uh, 
1 Kings chapter 12, we're going to start reading verse number 3. That they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. They're making a deal. Look, we'll serve you. We'll love you. You know, you're the king. We'll do what you want, but please just take it a little bit easy on us. You know, we've been working and toiling really hard for your dad. Verse number five, and he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed, and King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon and his father while he yet, while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. He's saying, If you look well to what you're doing now, if you can give them this, Give them what they're asking for. Be humble. Be a servant and show them that you are serving them and you're hearing them. They'll they'll be loyal to you. They'll stick with you. And these were the wise men that were learning under under his dad, under King Solomon, who who gained his wisdom. This was the righteous advice. But verse number 8 says, But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him. And which stood before him, and he said unto them, What counsel give ye, that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. That's pretty rough. And this is coming from the spoiled brats that had everything. That was his young men that all grew up in the same in the same group, the same rule, you know, the same wealthy people in his father's house. They had everything handed to him to say, "Oh, well, I could be." You think my dad was tough? Well, I could be tough. Lacking wisdom. Lacking understanding and just trying to, to talk and act real tough and not really looking to their own ways and just thinking, well, I'm the king, so I'm just going to, you know, being wise in his own conceits is what he's doing. Because I'm the king, I'm just going to tell you, you thought you had it bad before, but you better watch out for me. I'm going to be a lot tougher than my dad was. And you know what happens? He loses almost everything. This one instance, one thing happened, and he lost almost everything. The cost of not having wisdom, not taking good counsel, not getting good, not not receiving the good advice that you've been given. Take this to heart too. When someone, when when you you know someone that's able to give good advice that you could trust, that you think you know that that, that you trust has, has got a good a lot of godly wisdom. And they tell you something, and you decide just to... And, and look, I'm not saying you just, you just have to listen to everything everybody ever, you know, someone ever says to you, but, but forsaking good advice and good wisdom can come at a big cost and, uh, and really treat it properly. So the king answers, I'm here, and, and I'm just going to skip ahead because he answers them exactly the same way. Verse number 16 So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute. So the tax guy he sends out. And all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. All based on his foolish answer. They rebelled against him. They killed the tax guy. Oh, you think you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna tax us now? Yeah, right. You're not our leader. He lost it. He lost his authority, he lost his power over them because they, they didn't give it to him. They refused to give him that authority. And um, <clears throat> let's go back to Proverbs 20, 27. We'll read the last few verses and we'll close it up. Verse number 25 The hay appeareth in the tender grass, showeth itself. 
and herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance for thy maidens. Now, um, you know, obviously God has given us as humans, as mankind, the dominion over the earth and over the animals. And that's why I think, uh, you know, these extreme, I don't call them leftists or whatever, the people who are, who are really into the environment and really into the animals and like the, the, the vegan type that just think it's, it's horrible for you to eat eggs and to, to do, you know, let alone eat meat. I mean, you know, these people don't have their heads screwed on straight. The Bible tells us specifically, I mean, God's given us the animals that deserve to eat. And the vegetables, and the tree, you know, and you know, he's given all this. We have dominion over it, and we have right to do what we want, basically, with 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 all these other beasts and and uh, this, you know, the the trees and the, the agriculture and everything that God has given unto us. We have dominion over it. Now, obviously, we should be wise with it. We should be smart, and not and not just you know go around just slaughtering a bunch of animals for no reason or whatever. But um, God's given us this stuff. He says the lambs are for thy clothing. Right, we ought to shave them and get the wool and get the you know and be able to, to spin it and use that for clothing. The goats are the price of that field, and it says, "And thou shalt have goats' milk enough for thy food." I, I've heard, I've even heard Christians saying how weird it is that you drink milk from an animal, and that's why you know it's understandable for for a baby to drink their mom's breast milk because that's still a person. But when you're drinking an animal's milk, that's bizarre. That's weird. There's nothing weird about it. The Bible says that, that the goat's milk is going to provide for you and for your household. I mean, that's, that's what it's there for. We are to consume this stuff. There's nothing wrong with consuming the milk of goats or cows or you know, these animals to, to sustain us and to get nutrition. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's good and, and it's given to us by God. Well, that's it for Proverbs 27. Let's probably have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great wisdom that we've been learning throughout, through every week of going through the book of Proverbs. God, I pray that you would please help some of the things. I know tonight we touched on a lot of different topics, dear Lord. And, um, but th- those things that are important to each individual, dear Lord, whatever, whatever people needed to hear tonight, dear God, I pray that you please help us all to walk away with some greater truth and understanding that will help us in our life, dear Lord, that will help us in our understanding and in our doctrine that we can um, continue to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.